people where a war comes to their doorstep and on Monday they were the postman and on Tuesday they were militant. The same thing happened in Syria. You know, the same thing happens in Palestine. The same thing that happens in Afghanistan. These people all have lives. These people all have aspirations, dreams. They're normal people. Jay Hanrahan, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, mate. Thanks for having me. You are recently back from Ukraine. You left the day before everything started, but that you didn't mean for that to happen. That was just a uh, fortunate timing, I guess. I mean, it was kind of, I think it was like two days actually, but it was, it was one of these things where, you know, me and the guy I was working with, my mate Johnny Pickup, we were there, we were like, shall we stay? It's probably not going to happen, you know, because it just, I don't know, it was, it just seemed almost inconceivable. I don't know why, but it did at the time. We had, a, we'd, we'd been filming anyway, we'd been filming with like the training, the militia training. So it's like, we had a good film anyway, um, which we're editing now. And I was like, you know what, I've got things to do. Um, I've got family commitments. He's the same. We said, all right, we'll go back. And then, you know, two days into the edit, I get a call in the morning, like, they've done it, they've invaded. It's like, wow, Jesus. Why did you think it wasn't going to happen? Honestly, it was, I think, maybe the mood in Kiev, you know, like, like four days before the invasion, we were out chatting to people at the pub, you know, stuff like that, you know, local Ukrainians in Kiev, and they were like, no, there's no way, like, it's not going to happen. The government wasn't really preparing bomb shelters, like, it, it, I know that you know, Biden said it's going to happen. And then all these other intelligence agencies did, but they said it was going to be on this day, then this day, then this day. And I think the enormity of it just, you know, naively, perhaps I a lot where well, it wasn't just me, a lot of people just thought, nah, probably not going to happen like that. Probably just the East. But lo and behold, you know, he went in, uh, you know, full pelt. What is it like then? I know that you've been back since this fighting's fully started, but you are, you've got Popular Front, which is your uh, organization, conflict reporting, independent journalism and stuff. And you guys are putting out an unbelievable amount of videos, footage. You've got friends. You've literally, we've had to delay recording because one of your mm -hmm. friends has rang from Kiev to say that there's been some heavy bombing going on. Can you try and explain to people <clears throat> what life is like for civilians in Ukraine at the moment? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a good question because there's a lot of focus on the West kind of lording up this and lording up that. Or then it's like online political people screaming that their ideology isn't being appeased. The reality is people on the ground, civilians, you know, like you've just said, are living in bomb shelters. There are people like the I saw some photos earlier. There's like a makeshift hospital um, in 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 one of the you know, in the in one of the basements. There were children with cancer you know, under bombardment now, like getting treatment in a basement best they can. A little girl, a six-year-old girl was killed um, the other day. Uh, a rocket landed near a supermarket and she was killed. Um, the, the photos are just just horrific. Like there was a, you know, a, a photojournalist just happened to be with his family and they're rushing her into the hospital and she just dies on the bed. The mother's just there like crying. You know, it, it's absolutely brutal. Um, and there's a lot of political kind of nonsense going on and and I really think that the focus it's like yeah well civilians are dying right now I think it's around 135 civilians have been killed in one week um 13 of those were children 400 people civilians wounded around 1000 to 2000 fighters on each side killed um it's one week in it's madness you know it's very very serious very brutal and Russia is no matter which way you're painting it they they are indiscriminately hitting civilian areas right now you know they're bombing apartment blocks um, like, like you just said, um, a bomb just went off or a rocket hit, I should say, um, near the, near the, one of the train stations, the train stations, the subway system is where everybody goes for the bomb shelters. Like what, what strategic target possibly could that be? I don't know, but it does seem to be like, you know, they're going after civilians. We've seen them do the same thing in Syria. Um, not to say that the West doesn't do the exact same thing. Um, everybody wants to do this, that, and the other, like, oh, what about, what about? It's like, yes, yes, very seriously. I mean, like two months ago, um, America wiped out a whole civilian family in, Af in Afghanistan as they were leaving and just were like, toodaloo, no one was charged, nothing happened. Awful. But right now, you know, we're talking about Ukraine. Yeah, it's like, yeah, civilians are getting bombed left and right. It's really bad. Are there food's no... running out as well, I should say. Like, sorry, yeah, the, the food is running out as well and medicines as well. I just spoke to a friend and she's like, my grandma, she's in Kharkiv, she's, she's 95 a medicine's going to run out in a couple of days. Like, what can we do? It's just, it's so brutal, man. Are there no rules? I don't understand whatever it is, the, the rules of engagement uh, around the sort of targets that you can hit. If you decide to invade a country, are you just allowed to indiscriminately target um, missiles wherever you want? 
I mean, you know, there is there is the Geneva Convention and, you know, war crimes, but essentially it doesn't that doesn't really exist. You know what I mean? No one sticks to it. Really. I don't know. I don't know what you mean. So, I mean, um, you know, I mean, there's an, there's an example of like NATO. You know, there is um, a few years ago, there's videos of Turkish soldiers um, murdering prisoners of war. There's a video of them like holding a beheaded, you know, the prisoner of war. They're holding the head. That's a Na- that's NATO's second largest army. There wasn't even an investigation, you know, like NATO's kind of just poo poo it. Oh, it's Kurdish rebels. Don't worry about it sort of thing. So, you know, again, another incident, um, Turkey burned a load of civilians to death in a basement um, in a town called Jizra in southeast Turkey in 2016. And, you know, nothing really happened, you know. So it's, it's you know, it's it's very, the West is, is very firmly on their high horse right now. But, you know, there is no real rules. Let's be honest. There is. You know, the concept of war crime, I'm not saying that we should ignore it. Of course not. It's brutal. It's disgusting. But at the end of the day, when war happens, a lot of the rules go clean out the window. You know what I mean? It's just it's unfortunately the way it is. Things get very primitive and very nasty things happen, you know. And Russia has just said, you know, we're going to just do this, I guess. Not that they're justified at all. I think it's absolutely horrendous and abhorrent whenever civilians are targeted. Like, it's just disgusting. Um, And I think in, in terms of like, I don't know about legal laws, but like natural law, it's just like horrendous. You know what I mean? If there's a hell, you know, those people deserve to go there. But it, it's, yeah, when you're talking about rules of engagement, it gets very flimsy when the war starts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that makes sense. You yeah. said that you were in town, whatever, in the pub four days before most of the people that were there that were civilians that are now facing the potential of being hit with missiles basically didn't think that it was going to happen. It seemed like the government didn't think it was going to happen. Does that mean that in terms of provisions, protection, preparation, there's, there's, um, it's insubstantial? Yes, definitely. Yeah, that is that is true. I mean, don't get, I'm not knocking Zelensky. He has really risen to the kind of the occasion. You know, he's definitely, I, I respect that he's staying with the people there. He's in Kiev. It's it's you know the U.S. offered to take him you know to take him out like we'll get you away. He said no, he's staying here. Like fair play to him, but there's a lot being ignored here while people are loading up Zelensky. There's a lot being ignored. The fact that the bomb shelters weren't properly readied. We interviewed a lad, a um, very good local reporter in Kiev, who the week before had gone around to all the bomb shelters that the government had designated. Some of them like there was padlocks on them and it had a number. Call this number. He called the number and the woman was like, I don't know why everybody's ringing me. There is no key, you know, things like that. There's not enough food provisions. So whilst whilst on one degree, it's like, yeah, okay, Zelensky is doing his thing now. I do start to think like what was happening before that, you know, like why wasn't there more preparations? It's not for me to say maybe, but I think it's worth looking at, you know, essentially in the long run. But right now, I guess that is not really here nor there it's happened and this is what's happening now but yeah i i would agree that it it seemed to me anyway and we spoke to a lot of people you know covered a lot of things and um it it didn't yeah it didn't look like there was proper preparations you know we went to there was one place it was a bomb shelter but it was also a strip club (laughs) you know it was used as a strip club because you know no one's had to use the bomb shelter and that's fine you know whatever and it was kind of funny but at the end of the day it's like well shouldn't shouldn't that be gutted and turned into you know there was no preparations there there wasn't stacks of food there wasn't heating there wasn't blankets that you know what i mean it's that's not that's not really preparation they just sprayed a thing on the wall saying bomb shelter in case of emergency or something like that and it's like that's not really preparation you know what i mean um so yeah i definitely think you know there's that could have been done more but again there's a massive subway system in you in kiev especially and across ukraine so you know, I know that a lot of people are down there, but yeah, it's it's very it's looking bad. What would you say? Uh, how would you say that the Russian offensive's gone so far? Do you reckon that they expect it to be further along than this by this point? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. I'm kind of you know through and through a reporter on the ground. I don't really look too much into the kind of analysis and that because I've seen things happen at war where it's like you know, 50,000 analysts are telling you this and you get there and you're like, oh, this is not at all what it is, you know, not to disrespect them, but it's it's quite easy to do an analysis from the desk. But I will say that I do think that Russia, the signs you can see that Russia perhaps expected it to go quicker than this is that, um, I can't remember the exact one, but Russia basically, and um, Putin, I should say, um, sacked one of his like head kind of commanders, you know what I mean? Replaced him quite early on, I think like the fourth day of the invasion. So I think that gives you a sign that something, and you know, something's not right here, something's not really going the way they did. And and honestly, you know, the 
it's the Ukrainian resistance is very real. You know what I mean? I've been back and forth to Ukraine, I think almost 10 times uh, since I was 27. So I'm 32 now, you know, a couple of years, a little while. I've been back and forth to the front lines all over the place. The culture they have there is one of resistance. You know, it's very, I mean, you just have to look at the amount of people joining the citizen militias. Every, every people, I'm talking to friends there, like reporters, and I'm like, oh, how's the fix you're working with? And they're like, oh, he's gone. He joined the resistance. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, there's a lot of people. There's mechanics. There's metal workers are making big, what they call hedgehogs, like big kind of spiked metal things to put in the road to try and deter tanks or, or armoured vehicles. Everyone is doing their bit. You know, there, there's, um, I think we spoke to a, a lad yesterday and he was saying that there was like, um, well, we did speak to a lad yesterday, but he was saying that there was like a, a guy that was a roofer just preparing Molotovs, you know, just for everybody in the street. You know, it's it's everyone has kind of come together and there is like a real resistance, which is commendable. I think anyone that's been invaded by by a country and they're a sovereign state and whatever, like fair play, they can resist. It's absolutely their, their project to do so. But I don't think they can resist completely. You know, I think Kiev is going to fall, unfortunately. It will take longer than Russia expected. And it has been a bit of a meat grinder. You know, the, the Ukraine military are really a lot more prepared, a lot more powerful than they were um, in 2014 after the revolution when, you know, Russia annexed Crimea and the, the fighting started in the east of Ukraine. But but the, the problem is, like, Russia is an incredibly powerful military, you know, and they, they have, you know, Ukraine is completely outgunned. Um, and Russia has already shown that they will do, they will go all the way in terms of we will just bomb civilians, we will just do that, you know what I'm saying? So... I think that's a worry. However, I will say that once they do start taking major cities, the guerrilla warfare will start and that will be hell for the Russians. I really believe that. Not on any kind of romantic level, just as a, as an observation of I've covered a lot how, of guerrilla. How so? War. What do you mean? Well, it's, you know, if you've got like a united people, I mean, you've got people, there's militias from all different backgrounds there. Unfortunately, there's like far right militias, but there's also Jewish militias. There's Chechen militias, Rus um uh, Belarusian militias. There's an anti-fascist militia right now that is just gathering steam. So everybody is coming together and are like, right, we're fighting. We're not having. And it they're, sort of they're going side by side. So you would have potentially yeah, yeah. a Jewish yeah, yeah. militia and a Nazi militia fighting shoulder to shoulder. Potentially, you could. It's happened before. <laughs> yeah, it's happened before. It's it's a weird situation and it's one that people jump on. But I've seen weirder things happen in war. You know what I mean? Like I said, a lot of the rules go out the window. All of the internet analysis is irrelevant completely. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Not that, you know, I mean, the, the far right element is is horrific. I, I think it's awful. But it is, it's not, you know, I mean, the president is Jewish. He was voted in with a 73% majority at the same time that the far right parties formed a coalition for that election. They got less than 3% of the vote. So the idea that the whole country is Nazi is not true. But the idea that, you know, the Nazi element is propaganda is also not true. It is a serious problem. But like I said, it's it's a, there's a very it's a very diverse country. There's 44 million people live there. It's huge. There's there's people from all over the place. Um, but, you know, it, it's 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 the guerrilla warfare element of it. I think we'll really we'll really see that if they start taking big cities, because, yeah, a lot of the, the you know, citizen militias will probably go. I didn't sign up for this. I'm leaving, actually. But a lot won't. A lot will go to ground and they'll set, set bombs and they'll, you know, you know, they'll start doing assassinations. Um, not because, you know, oh, Ukrainians are special. That's just how it happens. You know, we've, I've seen it in so many different countries. And when you have like a, a unit of people like that, that are well armed, I think Ukraine is the 22nd most armed country on earth. <laughs> you know, it's, they're not just going to go. There's only okay. 44 million people there. Yeah, and there's a lot of guns, you know what I mean? And a lot of weapons are coming in from the West. Um, and they'll make their own stuff. They already are, you know. And they're, they're already, a lot of these people are war veterans anyway, you know. They're, they're primed for this. They're ready. So I think you're going to see, unfortunately, like really horrific, you know, brutality. But again, it's, it's war, you know what I mean? And if someone comes in and takes their city, who's to tell them they're not allowed to resist that in any way possible, you know what I mean? How much of this, because you've, you've kind of identified that uh, when an invasion begins, this sort of more primitive, primal um, demeanor takes over the people that are being invaded. But it seems to me like the Ukrainian response has been pretty intense. You know, I've seen Alexander Usyk in yeah. full military <laughs> gear. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I've seen uh, Vladimir Lomachenko. In yeah, great. My, one of my favorite boxers. Yeah, unbelievable yeah. boxer. I mean, I yeah. wouldn't want to get in hand-to-hand -hand combat with him, but you know, like, why, are you, why are you rolling around with him? So my point is just that so many people have taken up arms in one form or another. Uh, how how co how common is it for the heavyweight 
heavyweight champions and you know ev- literally everybody that mm. can pick up mm. a gun to do that is this part of ukrainian culture or, or is this again just par for the course when you get an invasion no no you, you, it's a, that's a great question because yeah like i mean if that happened in britain I, I obviously you know influencers would not be picking up guns i'm sure you know anthony <laughs> joshua like, stood there with an ak-47 on the joshua, white cliffs but, of dover know, <laughs> But like, you know, maybe Fury as well. Like, but but I think most, you know, influencers would be kind of hashtagging themselves and thanks for the support. But I doubt, you know, the militias would form like that. I think the Ukrainian culture is quite specific in that they've been, again, it's an amalgamation of all different people. I think that, you know, that it's a very, very old history. I think it's like 800 AD. The Kievan Rus was like, a, you know, that's where Kiev kind of started. It's a very old culture. And they've been invaded, you know, they were under occupation, they've they've been, well, you know, they were part of the USSR for a bit, there was um, a lot more horrific massacres from the USSR, there was Nazi, you know, the Nazis invaded as well, unfortunately there was like a lot of Ukraine collaborators as well with the Nazis, so it's just a mad country with, like, not mad, I don't mean like, oh, they're mad, it's just like a very kind of, I don't know, like an interesting culture of like resistance, war, horrible war crimes you know massacres it's just in their culture and i think they're at a stage now where they're just like we already have the basis we know what's coming so we're not gonna you know we're not gonna accept it anymore and i really like ukrainian people like in general like they're very kind of stoic but very fun people very funny very eloquent people i keep seeing all these idiots like kind of strange internet people that are like isn't it isn't it convenient that this guy came up with this one liner Oh, it's clearly propaganda. It's like you've clearly never been to Ukraine (laughs) because the people are coming out with that all the time. They're very funny, very sharp people. Same with Russians as well, like very similar culture. Russians, great people. I think it's sad that the way (laughs) there's a really disgusting current happening right now. For example, earlier I saw that the Glasgow Film Festival had cancelled two screenings of two Russian films. Nothing to do with the Kremlin not propaganda like what what are you doing like why are you persecuting a normal russian person for something the government has done you know i mean look at boris johnson in my opinion he's horrendous imagine if people then started saying oh no brits allowed here you know what i mean you would be like oh that's unfair you know so i think you have to look at it like that but yeah to, to answer your question i just think that it's part of their culture there's a lot of weapons and they've been at threat for war from a long time and since 2014 the war in East Ukraine has been active. You know, people seem to forget that. Last year, I think more than 50 Ukraine servicemen died on the front lines. Now, people say, oh, that's not a lot. but it was meant to be a ceasefire. It's quite a lot. You know what I'm saying? Um, So, uh, you know, the media, there's this thing now that, oh, suddenly people care about Ukraine. It's like, well, only for the last two months. For the last eight years, the media has not been that interested. You know, I, I remember going there and making Frozen War, you know, the Frozen Conflict documentaries, and people, one lad died the day we were there sort of thing, you know, like after we'd left and that. But, you know, it's just like, yeah, it's, it's been an active war. And now it's an even bigger war now. It's it's just, it's in their culture and it's, it, you know, they're, they're tough people, basically, you know. Who are some of the other celebrities that I might have missed off that uh, Ukrainian oh, people that have joined? Have you seen some others? I see, um, I see Usyk, I see Lomachenko. I've seen, well, he's not a celebrity, but the former president, um, what's his name? Anyway, it don't matter. The former president, he was in Poland, I think. There was some kind of dispute between the current president, some kind of theatrics. The current president wanted to arrest him for something. So he was in Poland and he came back. But when the war started, he just came back, handed his passport in and was you know, filmed on the streets with a rifle. He's quite an old man. Maybe that's just for show, but maybe it's not. How, you know how much I mean? truth was there in those stories around 80-year-old ex-servicemen turning up? Oh, yeah. Was that true? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, without a doubt. I, I mean, that's that's I've seen a lot of like post-Soviet states, just old lads, just like, right, let's go. You know, they've they've done it. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that that's not true. Definitely not. How useful they'll be in a war. I don't know, you know, because perhaps they're not so mobile, but fair play to them. You know, they're they're out there. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. We, we interviewed a 61 year old man at the training um, a week ago. And he was like, yeah, like he was a Microsoft, he worked for Microsoft. He was like an IT engineer. And he was like, look, I'm learning to, you know, use a rifle. I'm learning to do this just in case. So there's definitely, you know, as much as people don't want it to be true sometimes, you know, there's a lot of very tough people that are just, I I think the West has this weird perception of like tough people are like Rambo and big guys with tattoos. It's like, no, man, like the most unassuming people I have met, like guerrilla fighters, you know, if they were in their normal clothes. You would just, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't pass them in the street, <laughs> you know. And it's these are the people that really come to come to the battle. It's not about being a big guy. It's about, 
you know, have an integrity and, and they want to fight for something. And, and a lot of people, you know, unfortunately it's war, but a lot of people do actually flourish in that. Yeah, my friend has a buddy who's a, a weightlifter out in Ukraine, and right. he's been sending me some of the communications that he's had back and forth, just Facebook Messenger or whatever. And this like, most recent voice note that he had was maybe the start of this week, and he said um, they're not letting guys through at the border, so my only goal now is to send my daughter away somewhere so that yeah. she's safe, and me and my friends are going to get some guns and we're going to fight. I'm thinking that's... He's just some bloke. Yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah. Yesterday or whatever, but one week ago, he was just some bloke that had a daughter and a family and interests and fears and goals and dreams for his life. And now he's, it's like this weird sort of cultural conscription that's mm. that's gone on that he's wanted to be a part of. Or I don't know. I mean, maybe you resign yourself to this fact. Have you got any idea about... Um, what the response has been like to the restriction of men being able to leave at the border and how uh, severely that's been enforced? I mean, it depends. I mean, the, the first um, the first day of the invasion, the lad that I was working with, the local journalist, the fixer, we would call them, you know, a field producer, whatever, um, Sergei Slipchenko, a really good lad. He's got two young children and a wife, and he was like, right, I need to get them out. You know what I mean? He's like, I'm going to go with them. You know, he's a dad. He's not a fighter, which is fine. Like, you know, not everyone has to be. He does his own bit. And he was like, I'm getting out. And he got out. OK, you know, uh, I know a lot of men that have got out as well. Um, I, there has been footage of people getting turned back. You know, there's been awful, some really awful footage, actually, as well, of like uh, Nigerian and Indian students being told they're not allowed on the train, like Ukrainians first. And people saying, oh, well, of course, it's Ukrainians first. It's like, I'm sorry. That's wrong. That's wrong. You know, if there's someone in your country, they're students, they're working there, whatever, that, that's a citizen. Like you let you, you treat them the same. You should do. I get it. War isn't like that, unfortunately. And not everybody can be nice like that. But it doesn't mean you ignore it. You know what I mean? It's racism, essentially. That was bad. Um, really bad. And but yeah, there's there's a lot of people kind of have got out as well. I'm not sure how true that is. To kind of touch on your other point, though, like, yeah, it's it's it is really interesting. That's why I've always mostly in my career, I've been covering what's called like a regular warfare. So not like, you know, not armies on armies, but like rebel fighters, people like what, what you know, is happening in Ukraine, people where a war comes to their doorstep. And on Monday, they were the postman. And on Tuesday, you know, they're a, mili they're a militant. The same thing happened in Syria. You know, the same thing happens in Palestine. The same thing that happens in Afghanistan. These people all have lives. These people all have aspirations, dreams. They're normal people. Um, and it's a really weird thing now. I, I don't mean this directed at you at all, but there's a weird thing now where people are like, oh, Oh, they're Ukrainians. Wow. They were just not. And it's like, well, yeah, that's been happening. <laughs> you know, that's been happening. And half the reason it happens is when, you know, our countries <laughs> end up bombing somebody, you know, and it's like, well, they were normal people. And now they're a fighter and they're a terrorist. But this one isn't. It's like, that's what? the one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. Thing, right. right. And, it, you know, there's a very I, I'm not trying to be like too tricky here. And I'm, I'm sure people will be like, oh, what about ism? It's not what about ism. It's just it's like, you know, there's a very clear <laughs> difference in perception of what's going on. You know, I've, I've met rebels in, in Kurdistan. I met rebels in Palestine that all have, you know, they do the same thing we do. They play PlayStation. They see girls. You know, they like football. The first question you get from a rebel when they find out you're from Britain is which football team? Every single time. Which football team do you support, you know? So it's like, it's it's like, yeah, um, it, it, you know, people are normal everywhere. But not to, not to take any any attention away from Ukraine, you know, I think this is, it, must be, it must be covered. And like you said, these are just normal people. Unfortunately, now a lot of them are going to die um as fighters or just civilians that get bombed um and that's that's the real tragedy you know where so obviously ukraine's very heavily armed whatever it is mm. 20, 22nd most armed country in the world 44 million people live there how are these guns like, where are these guns are they huge warehouses are they being distributed by some sort of central authority are the army helping with distributing these guns to the militia and also is there somebody that's managing the militia in terms of <laughs> movements and stuff like that uh <laughs> sort of i mean again it's you know when war when this kind of war happens so quickly mass whole country invaded like a, a lot of it goes out the window um i know that there's footage of you know um i think like the second day or the third day so they have what's called the territorial defense which is what i was filming with citizens that have no military experience mostly that just are getting trained by people with military experience kind of telling them this is what to do if we get invaded 
you know, guerrilla movements, checkpoints, how to listen to orders, you know, how to hold a gun, how to fire it. They were, they were all immediately called up. I think day one, actually, a lad told me yesterday they were on the street immediately in Kiev. A load of them didn't need to be told. They just went, right, I've got my training. So a lot of people have guns, you know, they have firearms. It's not like America, but a lot of people do have firearms. A lot of people have been buying up firearms before this happened. So they just took their gun and immediately went to the street. I think by like day three, there's videos of the military just turning up and saying, anyone that wants a gun, come and get one. Um, which is maybe not the best idea in the long run, but I guess when you're, you know, no one's coming to save them. NATO is not going to help them. They know that, you know, um, I guess, you know, what can you do? Open uh, the back of the truck up and just literally, that's, that's grab literally your magazine, grab a rifle. Crack yeah, on. and in po the post-war, you know, era will be very interesting to see. And a lot of people say, no, that's, it's really bad. What's going to happen after? But it's like, no one's thinking about that. What, what do just... they mean? Why, why is it going to be bad? Because you've got like, you know, loads of militias all armed, currently unified against Russia. But when that's done, what's going to happen? <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not just going to go, oh, OK, we'll put the guns away. Probably oh, not. I suppose that you can't just turn aggression on and off like a switch. Yeah. And there's going to be certain factions that want control of this area because, I don't know, 50 of their lads died fighting there. Um, and women, you know, there's, there's women as well fighting. And and then it might be one group that's like, well, we don't like your politics. We're going to kill you now. You know, it happened in Syria. I don't, I don't want to compare the two because people are doing that a little bit too um, kind of willy nilly. But, you know, that did happen in Syria. A lot of groups, once they chased out one threat, kind of infighting happened. You know, it's just natural human behavior, you know, and there's there's no reason that that wouldn't happen in Ukraine as well. But again, it's like, let's let's focus on what's happening now. You know, there, there are children dying. People are running out of food. And no one's coming to help, you know. I mean, the West is sending weapons and, and stuff like that, but not that I'm I'm, I'm not uh, advocating for a big, like, large scale, um, like, intervention. I mean, that would be crazy, I think, because no doubt that would cause a much broader war in the whole of Europe, which nobody wants. But you know, Ukrainians have realised that it, it's them. You know, it's all on them. We we spoke to a young woman that she just said, like, we need to be ready. I'm just I was just editing actually the doc, and she's like, we need to be prepared first before you know and she was like all the brains are here meaning like the ukrainians are here already that's that's what we need to rely on and i, I think they understand that um <laughs> yeah it's just in terms of like the mobilization there are there are um like a central command essentially that is saying like right this unit out there this unit there but it gets very messy you know and a lot of the militias kind of act autonomously and it's understandable to a degree. If you hear, oh, there's soldiers down there, right, let's go. Go you know to the I mean? soldiers, yeah, right. exactly. They're, it's not going to be sophisticated pincer movements with people no, stacking no. up against walls and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, dude, I mean, this is, it's interesting that you say, oh, this is nothing new. You know, we've seen this a million times before. This is literally what you specialize in, in terms of reporting. Mm. But this is the first time that I've seen, you know, just people, civilians, band together and try and create some ad hoc, ad hoc army uh, mm. that is mostly self-propelled, self-disciplined, self-taught. It's wild. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, I think the the difference is less attention was was put on the others. But I wouldn't say, you know, a lot of people saying all oh, the media didn't care when it happened in Syria. The, the media the media absolutely cared when it happened in Syria. You know what I mean? There was loads of reporters there. You know, several journalists lost their lives. Um there was a lot of media attention, not enough and there's not enough now still, but you know, the the media definitely did care. Um and you know, that that's what happened in Syria. You know, that's what happened in, in many different it's what happened is happening now in Su Sudan, you know happened in Sudan um, last year and the year before. It's happening in Eritrea. It's happening in, you know, um, not Eritrea, um, ugh, a country near there. But yeah, you know, there's a lot happening all over the world. Um, but I guess people are just more focused on this because it is Europe. You know, I do understand that. People are like, why are people so focused? It's like, well, if you live in Europe and you're just, you know, you're a normal person going about your life, you've got stuff to do, you've got worries, you've got bills, kids, this, that, and the third. You, you're obviously going to be more worried about, the war that's closer to you, you know, it's just human nature. That's just, that doesn't mean you're a bad person or you don't care about people from a different country. It's just the way it is, you know? And I, I think people are trying to do these big, you know, self aggrandizing tweets and all of that. Like, Oh, why doesn't, why, why don't people don't care about these people there? And it's like, look, people care because Ukraine is a four hour plane journey away, you know? And at the end of the day, there, there has been some awful things though in the media, like, CBS News had some guy on the other day and was like, oh, these these are not these are um, he didn't use the word savages, but he said, like, these are civilized people. Yeah, so, I saw <laughs> I saw that. 
like what the hell are you talking about like the middle east is like just one of the like most incredible places ever like poetry you know what i mean like just just incredible like infrastructure smart people learning language food as if like this place was some kind of island where people didn't exist before so i think there's a real problem with that people coming out with idiotic things like oh these are refugees with blue eyes and blonde hair like the hell does that matter you know what I mean? Like that's that is it's in my opinion it's internalized. Well, when it's not you, even internalized. It's mask off racism. You, well, yeah. When you're criticizing the Nazi militia and using that uh, in the right. next sentence, there's like use your brain. You know? Yeah. Uh, Have you got any great. idea how much support this invasion has from Ukrainian public people? Oh, not none. <laughs> well, I've got a, I've got a friend. I've got a friend whose family is Ukrainian. Russian yeah. speakers and they're they're happy about the they see themselves really? as, yeah they see themselves as a part of Russia they're oh, a, people in the east yeah like the there's so there's there's a lot of that's true yeah I should yeah I would say in Ukrainian I don't they don't consider themselves Ukrainian you know but like so sure like in the east there is a lot of you know the the Russian back separatist regions there's a lot of people there I mean the, the thing is though that I keep hearing this Russian speaker thing it's they they say oh they they don't let Russian speak. Everyone speaks Russian in Ukraine. More people they, speak so Ukrainian is is one language. Russian is another. Yeah, and yeah. most people speak both. I'd say most people speak Russian. Yeah, yeah. Like the idea that it's whether it's, you're whether you're a separatist or not. Whether you're a separatist or not. Yeah, right, yeah, okay. yeah. In Kiev, most people speak Russian. Yeah, yeah. Like it's you know like it's it's crazy. There's this idea that. Oh, they, they hate Russian speakers. It's complete myth, like utter myth. There was, I think, to be fair, there was like some ridiculous decree came out at the very height of the like war when it started in, in, in 2014, where I think someone in the government was like, we need to not allow Russian speaking, whatever. And then it very quickly was kiboshed. It was like, don't be ridiculous. Like, don't be so stupid. Like, and that was done. But that was it. You know what I mean? Like the idea that Russia is on all the signs, you know, it's like everybody speaks Russian there. Um, I'd argue that it's most people's first language, you know, in Ukraine. Um, they, they speak a mix as well. Like they'll say one sentence in Russian, one sentence in Ukraine. And that is not the issue. Um, the issue is that, yes, there's a lot of people in the East that identify as Russian. Um, that's their prerogative. That's up to them. No one can tell them they can't. But, but these Russian-backed separatists in this region, I've been there. I've been to that side. And there's this idea that it's some kind of like Russian socialist utopia. Like it's it's really not. It's it's very grim. Um, it's very totalitarian. There's no like free media there or anything like that. They were faking loads of on the lead up to this invasion. They were faking all these insane videos where the the one that sticks out specifically. They filmed um, like a body in a in a burnt out car, but the skull was all pulled back, and you could literally see the incision like line in the skull where. Clearly, there'd been an autopsy on that body already. You know, they'd taken it out of the morgue. Yeah, yeah, they'd taken it out of the morgue. Um, and there was a lot of weird things going on like that. When I was there on the, on the Russian back separatist side, they basically like faked a shootout. Like there was like, there's going to be a shootout. And like within five minutes, there was um, suddenly all of the minders that were with us didn't have their flak jacket and helmet on, despite them telling us there's going to be a shootout. And then when we got back, we looked at the front lines where we were, and it was like we weren't even facing the right direction. You know, it was very odd. So, you know, there's a lot of propaganda there. Not to say that the Ukrainians, uh, you know, don't do anything like that, but generally it's the, the Ukraine. The, the, look, the, the aggressor was in the East. I don't, you know, it's it's not a political thing to say. The Ukrainians overthrew their government. There was a revolution. And then Russia took Crimea, annexed it. There was a battle there. And then the separatists rose up and there was a battle there. You know, it's, it's, it is what it is. Um, but no, I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say there's a lot of support. Yeah, in the East, that's a good point. In the East, the people that feel that they're Russian and they've, I mean, they're, they're only allowed Russian TV channels there. You know, they can't get Ukrainian TV channels. So they've just been fed like state media for a long time. And they, you know, and it's up to them if they want to live in a Russian state. Sure, that's fine. But but I would say the vast majority of people in Ukraine are not for this. And and also, I'll be honest as well, actually, um, another thing that a local reporter showed me, there was in Telegram channels when Russia was putting out all this propaganda, like this fake stuff. There was a lot of people in the Donbass region, you know, Russian speaking, pro-Russian they were commenting and they were like, this is nonsense. Like, we know it's nonsense. Russia doesn't care about us. Not that they like Ukraine, but they're just like, Russia doesn't care about it. They're just using us, you know, which is, I think, accurate. You know what I mean? Um, so there's, you know, people aren't all one entity, but yeah, yeah. I mean, look, kids are getting killed right now and the whole country is in chaos um, and 500,000 more like people have, have fled. You know, I, I would say that 
any support is, is drastically diminishing for the Russians. How about in Russia in terms of the people that reject? So I've got mm. a guy who's in my uh, locals community and they posted earlier on this week. Uh, so while I still have the internet, you never know these days, quick update on what was happening here yesterday in St. Petersburg, massive anti-war rallies. I'm fine since I'm a fast runner, but a lot of people were arrested. Peace, hoping mm. for the best. Terrifying. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's really, I mean, you know, there, I think there were a thousand people arrested for just standing in the street peacefully saying, we don't want you to go to war with Ukraine. You know, there's a thing that I'm getting really annoyed about as well is the media just saying the Russians, the Russians. I get it. I get it. It's easy. I've said it as well. It makes sense. But it, sometimes you have to put it into context. You know, you, you're talking, I saw a map earlier. I think there's like, there's like 20 different anti-war rallies happening this weekend in Russia. You know, Russians are very, I, I've never met a Russian that I haven't got on with. They're like, and I know that's just personal anecdote, whatever, but still there are good people. They're lovely people. Very cool. Very good culture. The idea that they're all suddenly just going to go, okay, yeah, let, like let's kill everybody in Ukraine. No, they're not. But I will say this. I think, I think there is more people that are in favor of the war than is maybe projected in Western media. You know, the Western media is obviously kind of this united front you're seeing right now of like, oh, the, the Russians don't want this. The Russians don't want this. And it's like, yeah, a lot don't, but a lot either don't care or they do want it. There's a lot of pro Putin, you know, and even if they're not pro Putin, they're like Russian ultra nationalists, you know, um, that do want this to happen. So yeah, there, there is, there is an element of that. Um, but it's the same with any war, you know, it's just, it's just nobody is, no one's a monolith, you know, but I, I don't know, I don't know any percentages, but I would just, I would definitely say there were probably hundreds of thousands of people in, in Russia, without a doubt, that, that are completely not, not for this. I saw, I saw a thing in Siberia earlier, um, people just like, you know, pro-Ukraine, like, sorry that we're invading, our government's invading or whatever, you know. This, I wanted to talk about the way that the press, the corporate media, social media individuals have been putting this forward because this is the first time that i've seen a conflict that's essentially been that like the apocalypse has been live streamed via tiktok mm. and um i i mean I, i've seen from your stuff popular front i've seen tiktoks of how to destroy and drive tanks separate yeah how to drive one. them if you catch one yeah <laughs> yeah like there's some girl in a pair of balenciagas and a cool adidas pair of tracky bottoms mm. in there going so you flick these switches on and then you press this button and then you and then she, there's her driving along in the tank uh, yeah, yeah. so yeah. what would you say have you seen anything that's particularly uh unrepresentative or egregious with regards to corporate media in terms of what they've been saying from on the ground because i've got a lot of friends I, I spent a good bit of time in texas at the moment right texas is very skeptical uh around pretty much everything that comes out of at least where i am uh, around corporate media mm. there's a lot of people that are saying something doesn't seem to add up with what we're seeing i'm not convinced that what's happening on the ground is actually what's going on here and i think that the, the implied subtext there is that i don't think that the invasion is as bad or whatever and it's being blown up i think generally mm. what this shows is just a complete distrust like an absolute 100 percent distrust for whatever you see whether it's um a carryover from the last few years around uh, hunter biden's laptop story kind of being pushed down that was to do with ukraine trump is a russian agent in 2016 and then so on and so forth so i'm wondering whether that has contributed a little bit but certainly people just do not seem to be particularly convinced around what has been put forward by the press. So give me your thoughts on mm. what we've seen so far and what's been good and what's been bad. Uh, <laughs> America. I think America is its own beast. Um, I'm going to insult a lot of Americans here, but I, I don't care. I think the problem with Americans are they see themselves at the center of every story on earth. How can we make this about us? So instead of seeing a child bombed and killed, they go, how can I make this about me? Oh, um, I don't trust this. I don't think it's real. Well, the mother is crying and her kid is dead. So I don't really care if your brain worms <laughs> don't allow you to think this is real. And trust me, I have a lot of problems with legacy corporate media myself, having been through it and seen a lot of weird stuff. Nothing conspiracy, just like bad behavior, whatever. But generally, I think people are doing a pretty good job. You know, I have friends out there right now on the ground, dodging bombs and bullets. A cameraman died today. He got struck at Baba Yar, which is a Holocaust memorial. Um, and Russia bombed right near there, uh, and they killed a cameraman. Um, so when people are like, 
I don't believe it. I just think, fuck you. You know, like I, because my friends are there right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's very real. Um, is, does someone have an agenda? Sure. Everybody on earth does. Not interested. For me, I'm interested in the people on the ground. You know what I mean? I've, I've been getting equal hate again from Americans. There was some weird thread today where someone was like, don't trust Jake Hanrahan's reporting because of, and it was all just like weird American radical politics, centrist, central um, selfishness. You know, they're all like, I think this, how can I make this about me? And it's it's actually repulsive. You know, I, I was talking to a friend today and we were speaking about it and we were calling it like a uh, timeline support, you know, like people, oh, how can I make this about me? Well, I'll tweet something about this. It, it's been the same with every war. It was exactly the same in Syria. Um, and as well in Syria, Syria was exactly the same like in Ukraine is in terms of normal people, you know, in Adidas tracksuits doing the same things. I've seen Syrians before this telling people how to use tanks and armored vehicles. It was on Instagram before because TikTok didn't exist. Um, the the um, the Arab Spring was was primarily um, kind of broadcast via Twitter when Twitter was like really useful because um, a lot of their uh, Internet was shut down by the dictators in their countries. And they went to Twitter and they found ways to bypass the the ban. And they just they just citizens putting everything out on Twitter. So really, the Arab Spring was probably like the first real kind of social media war in that sense. Um, but yeah, this this whole like, oh, I don't trust this. I don't trust that. I don't trust a lot of things as well. But you, you're telling me that you basically, you know, like if I told you a secret right now, like it wouldn't be kept, you know, like you can't keep a secret between three people. And it must it might be the most basic thing. Are you telling me? Hundreds of thousands of people from media organizations all over the world are in on this, doing something fake, and not one of them has exposed it. You know, it's nonsense. Yeah, there's a big problem, like like you said, Hunter Biden's laptop, because like liberal media was just as bad as the conservative media for covering their own ass. We just want to project. American media is its own beast. You know, I don't think it represents journalism very well at all. But that was because of political infighting, and we must be the ones that this, that, and the other. It's not because of some conspiratorial thing. It's just it's just selfishness at every degree. So I think they're all a part of the same thing. I mean, you've seen the same on the other side. Fox News are acting like this isn't a big deal. They're scum. You know, there are children dying to act like this is just fake. And I just find it so awful. And again, it all comes down to American exceptionalism, self-centered. How can we make this about us? Oh, we, we don't trust this because of that. No one in Ukraine cares if you lot believe it. You know what I mean? Like they're dying. They're fighting. So and it's not all Americans, definitely not. It's just that American media bubble. Like most Americans are completely normal and they're like, they, you know, they're fine. But I think that media bubble that's getting amplified unnecessarily is just actually sickening and selfish. How are people in Ukraine, it, it, a lot of TikTok, you've mentioned Telegram a bunch. Yeah. Is that one of the primary modes of communication? Yeah, yeah, yeah Telegram is one of the primary ones um, just because... I mean, there's less censorship on it. You know, I mean, Jesus, I mean, my my platform, Popular Front, we've got like, I think, 400,000 followers now and we get censored all the time. You know, we, I mean, when we're reporting on ISIS, we have to put an exclamation mark instead of I. So like I, <laughs> S, exclamation mark. But that S. shows, I mean, the, the stupid thing Not about that is it, it's yeah. so rudimentary. Like it's such a dumb solution to, you have to do it as well well have you guys thought about starting up your own telegram channel so that you can communicate stuff we have we have it we have one just in case but essentially the main broadcast everyone's on instagram not everybody's on telegram you know what i mean and to be fair um i actually spoke to someone at instagram a while ago they kind of hit me up and were like yeah you've been unfairly banned there was reasons there was a certain nationality didn't like the reporting you know someone working there decided we shouldn't show the plight of the kurdish people so we got we got a lot of bands and they kind of told me like look i've kind of put a thing on your account it's going to be okay now and to be fair it's been good now like we haven't been banned you know it's wow. okay yeah yeah so it really comes down to that we have been shadow banned um which you know it's very funny instagram says isn't true i think there was an investigation recently that showed it was there were different rules for verified accounts stuff like that um and yeah, so there's all that, there's censorship, you know, but, but anyway, so I don't want to make it about me, <laughs> but, but I'm, to, to, I'm doing the American thing now. But to go back to your point, yeah, Ukrainians are using Telegram, Instagram, Twitter, you know, mostly t uh, Telegram, I think, though. Um, Instagram a lot now as well. Instagram's like a big one. Um, luckily, Facebook are not censoring them too much. What's the sort of stuff oh. that, they're, that they're talking about? I mean, are there, is this troop movements? Is this, I've seen a, I saw a video of a... Uh, uh, an image of how to where to throw Molotov cocktails at Russian tanks, weak points, yeah. vulnerabilities, and stuff like yeah. that. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that was actually made by the government. Yeah, yeah. So the yeah the the um the the Ukrainian people are very tech savvy. There's a massive like IT industry there, like absolutely massive. My uncle, like two weeks before the war, was like helping set up some IT firm there. He worked for an IT business, and now they've all had to come back. You know what I mean? But there's a massive IT uh, IT kind of vibe there. There's like very there's a lot of hackers, like big time hackers. Um, I saw some hackers that got into the like I think the Russian power grid. You know, they were like, you know, posting out information on that. So everybody's doing their bit. People that don't want to fight with a gun are fighting. There's a massive cyber war, if you want to call it, going on right now, which is going largely undocumented, which is understandable because it's quite hard to understand. And it, the main focus is on lives being lost um, and physical force, you know, campaigns. But there's a massive like cyber war going on. Um, there's civilians are like blocking roads, barricades are being put up. You know, it, everybody's doing their bit and it comes down to that. So when they're sharing stuff, it's generally like, it's either like, look what's happened. We need to, because obviously that's like one of the most essential things, tell the world about this. Otherwise it goes unnoticed. And the other thing is, yeah, like sharing techniques, um, you know, like, like you said, infographics on where to throw the Molotov. I'll be honest, I don't think that's, it's not that useful that to be honest i mean uh, you can you can actually it can be useful but it'd be very hard to time it you know well, what i mean? saw I'm a video this may have even been on your on one of your instagrams yeah of some someone was in the passenger seat of a car and the driver or maybe maybe this was from the driver and they were driving past a tank and they just had a molotov cocktail here and just sort of like you Good. would like like with a tab yeah, you yeah. know, you'd have finished up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's finished this and just chucked it out. But I'm pretty sure that they caught a little bit of the, uh, yeah, yeah, like the, yeah, yeah. is this the same video? Is this the one that I've yeah, seen yeah, from you right guys? Yeah, yeah, but that's just the... some yeah. bloke or some girl just casually throwing a Molotov cocktail out at a tank that they're yeah, driving yeah. past. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, I've, I've seen it happen hundreds of times, you know, in person. Like um, a, a great example is Turkey, you know, like the way the kids do it there they'll get like you you go they'll turn up with a hold all you know like a bag and all the beers that they've drank that week they keep all the bottles and they're like <laughs> they're handing them out handing them out and they line up and when the military vehicles come it's like one two three four so like 50 molotovs hit the thing at once that is useful because sometimes it hits the right point and it actually burns out the vehicle there's videos of like you know russian military jumping out their vehicle on fire uh sorry the turkish military in that part of the world but there's, there's also like a lot of it is more like distraction you know and it's it wouldn't be very if you're in a an armored vehicle and you just see flames everywhere I, you're going to be like right out i better get out so i think it's more helpful for like distraction techniques and you know just just showing that aggressiveness is there like you know and i think that there's a level of like resistance that needs to be kind of sustained if they want to, if any guerrilla or rebel force, whatever wants to be successful because they essentially need to make it a quagmire for the, you know, for their enemy. And it just needs to be, like, I, I remember in Kurdistan, they were digging trenches in the road, you know, the, the Turkish police and military would come out and just fall into a ditch in the road. And they're like, Oh, <laughs> you know, like, you know, the, the tiniest things like putting out little things to pop the tires um you know putting sugar in in petrol tanks stuff like that you know it, it's going to come to that level of like rudimentary guerrilla warfare i think uh, another thing that i think we'll start seeing which has been quite big in the middle east um you know like a dji drone right you know like yeah, they yeah, feel yeah, yeah. that so people in the middle east middle east have um worked out how to like hook up uh like little grenades to it so they can just fly over your house and be like and drop it <laughs> you know what i mean and you be like what's that boom so you know that was really effective in iraq because it was more effective psychologically. Don't get me wrong, when they landed, if they landed right, the ISIS were putting mortar rounds on it, actually. But when they landed right, obviously people died. But the, the sound, people would zzz, and people would just scatter. You yeah. know what I mean? It's the same they thing as the, it, it's the same reason as the sniper, right? That it's so yes, pervasive. Yeah. You don't know when it's coming. It's this ambient yeah. anxiety. It makes troops move forward more slowly, all that shit. Yeah, definitely. I, I have felt that personally with like, when you hear there's a sniper around, you hear the crack. It's like, where? It's so horrible. You know, even a mortar, like a mortar round is so indiscriminate, really. And you just sit there and it's like, and you just wait. You know, obviously I'm not a fighter. I'm just, got, <laughs> I just get down. So you just hear that. It's like, and then you wait and then it lands somewhere, you know, and that is horrible. And yeah, a lot of that is psychological. You know what I mean? Because eventually that wears people down. And I think if Russia really plans to occupy cities, I good luck. To, well, not good luck to them. <laughs> you know, definitely not. But I think that's going to be a real, real pain for them. And a lot of 
a lot of these soldiers, man, even the Russian soldiers, look, they chose to enlist. Well, some of them are conscripts, but I, I've seen there was footage earlier of like they caught a Russian soldier. He's like 18 years old. He looks like a kid. Um, and they let him call his mum. You know, the Ukrainians caught him. They let him call his mum and he's drinking tea and he starts crying. You know, he you can just tell he's like, what am I doing here sort of thing? You know, not not to say that there isn't some really nasty you know, special forces that are killing people right now. But I'm just saying, like, a lot of the troops there are just just kids, you know, um, and they'll they'll get to a point where they just get demoralized. You know, yeah. I think already I've heard that a lot of them are a, a little bit demoralized already because I think they're like, I mean, Kadyrov, um, the kind of, I don't want to call him a Chechen leader, but the, the figurehead of that Putin put into Chechnya, he sent a load of Chechen forces to fight Ukraine. And he, like the next day he was on, on video call or something, like he does like Instagram lives or something in his Prada boots. And he was like, uh, oh, I didn't know the Ukrainians had so many weapons, <laughs> you know? And it's like, you can tell just from that phrase that I think he's a bit like, oh, Jesus, you know? Like, I think they've been sold something that they didn't expect. It's so strange. I'd never really thought about this before with war that um, I think maybe because thinking about World War One and World War Two, it was pretty apparent that most people that, went to war backed the idea of what they were fighting for you know you didn't want this fascist totalitarian state to mm. come and kill all of the jews and try and turn it into the thousand year reich mm. um but now you have much more transparency around information you know for the first time well maybe not for the first time ever again this is like me stepping into your world which has been going on for far longer than like the last week but you have an ability for um, infantry, army guys on the ground to understand the geopolitical uh, motivations and machinations of why something's happening. Yes. So you now actually have the ability for someone to ideologically be averse to something that their uh, loyalty suggests that they're supposed to go and do. Right. Why am I fighting? You know, before it was your commander said, go there. What are you going to do in World War One? Look at Twitter. No, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, no, it's a great point. I think I think as well, like you've made a good point there because I'm talking at this from like I'm a nerd, you know, like I, 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 I like I'm, I'm a reporter. I'm very focused on war and conflict. Obviously, that's my, most of my career. But I'm also very interested in the very like minute detail. That's what we do on Popular Front. We try and go really, really detailed to bring out make it make more sense to people you know sometimes people do that in a way that does the opposite but we try and make we like no we go into detail because then you understand things better for example you know there's very specific details like uh when it was with certain fighters that are like a guerrilla movement i found out that a lot of the kids in the inner city urban guerrilla movements were carrying an extra pair of socks in their pocket why because they put it over their trainers because they're all masked up so when the military are filming them Often they would line them all up afterwards and look at their trainers. They'd be like, right, this guy, this guy, this guy. So people were carrying extra pairs of trainers. They're putting socks over their trainers. To, you know, very rudimentary, but very smart way of like hiding from, you know, from from the military. So it's like for me, I'm very focused. I know that. But you're exactly right. Like most people, why should they? They don't have the time or they're not that interested in it. It's like, yeah, no, you're right. It's like this idea that, oh, why, why are people surprised? Yeah, of course they're surprised. You know, of course, because it's, it's more in focus now. Um but yeah, it's, it, that's a great point. Yeah, it's like a lot of Russians, obviously Russians are a very educated country as well. You know, it's, a lot of soldiers must just be like, Jesus Christ, you know, like there is no way that like every Russian soldier is some kind of Putin loyalist. It just, of course not, you know. The same way a lot of the militias that are now fighting for Ukraine are not government loyalists. You know, like I, like I said earlier, there's an anti-fascist group. There's a group of anarchists that I actually filmed a documentary with uh, a few years back what they did in Ukraine was they go about like beating up Nazis because like, you know, there's a Nazi street scene there. So the anarchists would go and just beat them up and stuff like that. Now they're like, OK, there's a Russian threat. We're going to we're armed up. We're going to fight all these idiots on the Internet. Like, oh, what, what so-called anarchists fighting for the government? They're like, no, we're not fighting for the government. We're fighting for our right to exist. When that fight, when that threat is gone, then we'll go back to like working out how we can live in this environment. But right now they're aware some of them are actually like Russian dissidents that have been in prison in Russia and came to Ukraine. They're very aware what's going to happen to them if Russia does take the whole country. So they're saying, no, you know, we're fighting. Again, it comes down to this thing of some like absolute like political esoteric nerd on Twitter has an opinion. And it's like, you don't know what it's like out there. You know, these lads are just like I, the, one of the lads, the anarchist lads, the day they invaded, I was like, like, what are you doing? 
He's like, I've got to go and I'm in a taxi. I'm going to enlist right now. Like, no, no, no question, you know. And he's like, I'm not fighting for the state. I'm fighting for my people. For, for, for you know, like, I feel like that is in Britain. I don't like the state. I'm anti-monarchy. Um, and I despise uh, the, the conservative party. And I also don't like the others as well. But if a war came here, I'd think, well, if I don't know if I would. I don't know if I'd be brave enough. But I think, well, am I going to fight for the state or the queen? No, I'm going to fight for my neighbours' right to be safe. You know, and Britain is more than the government or the well, media. That's, or that's the, it, you know, right? The, what the state and the monarchy and your leadership and the flag, they're all just uh, distillations of what it means to be a part of the country. And it arises right. in different ways right whether it be state whether it be monarchy whether it be nationalism uh but yeah i i think that that makes sense to me it's not hard to understand right i don't know why people find it so hard to understand like people are oh what there's anti-fascist fighting and there's also fascist battalions it's like yeah they don't like each other they just both have a threat coming to them for different reasons i mean they they dislike the people trying to kill them more than the people that they're ideologically opposed to right they can go right let's thing is in war a lot of realists really find their place in the world because they're smart and they go right put that on the break for a second here's the immediate threat you know if someone's coming at you at you with a knife and then another guy is coming at you with the fists you're probably going to want to take the guy with the knife out first you know then you'll deal with this lad with the you know whatever because the guy with the knife is probably going to kill you <laughs> you know what i mean so it's it's like not not to say that the 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 fascist threat is not as dangerous but it's dangerous in a different way it's not as immediate right now and and it's also a lot smaller. <laughs> You're talking about like a whole country invading you versus a couple of thousand people. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, it, it's it, I don't find it hard to understand um, the same way that, you know, um, in my family, we have, we have people that are like black, black British, they call themselves. A racist would find that really hard to understand. And it's like, well, yeah, because you're a scumbag. (laughs) You're a racist. You know what I mean? It's like that's hard for you to understand. But there's a lot of people that it's obviously not hard to understand. It's not just your your flag. You know, anarchists in Ukraine are not fighting for their flag. (laughs) You know, they don't even have a Ukrainian flag. They've got an anarchist flag. They're fighting for their people, for their neighbor and for their right to exist freely in the land that they were born and raised on, most of them. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm sure a lot of people do. Who cares? You know, these people are under threat right now. And people's kind of political takes are not important to them, nor should they be. What should we expect, do you think, over the next few weeks? Mm. Jesus, man. I, I, every day is something crazy. Like, you know, like just before we came on, like I just said, I was just chatting to my pal there. And he was like, just heard a boom, like right near to where we are, like in a hotel area. It's near an Ibis, you know, like a hotel there is this kind of long gone is the the era of like reporters being able to be like, oh, this hotel is the safe one. Like, this is, them, them rules are gone. Um, I mean, they barely existed anyway. But not that, I mean, who cares if the, the reporters are not that important compared um, to the people. But my point is like, all, all I think all all bets are off sort of thing. You know, um, right now the Russians have have control over like Chernobyl basically, or at least they're, they're, they're very close and they did have it controlled for a while uh, today they moved in close to what is, I think, Europe's largest nuclear power plant. Not that I'm not saying we're going to get nukes, nothing like that's going to happen. But I'm just saying, like, accidental destruction of that infrastructure could be very bad for a lot of people. You know, I just think the the after the kind of shock effect of just that level of fighting is going to be really bad. They I saw a video last night. It's what's called a MLRS fire. It's like multiple launch rocket system, and it's just like shoot, 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 like you know, like constant barrage of rockets completely ind- indiscriminate who knows what that's going to hit you know what i mean i mean doing that kind of stuff in chernobyl or around this this plan it's just so dangerous i think we're going to see serious serious civilian casualties i i don't want to predict anything but i think i think right now it's like you know i think 130 136 i think the exact number is but obviously that's hard to exactly quali- quantify but i think we're going to see that triple you know, without a doubt, if it carries on at this speed, we're going to see that triple. I think there's peace talks tomorrow, you know, talk of a ceasefire, but generally like the last ceasefire talks was last week and it was Russia just used it as like a troop rotation, you know, um, and they'll do the same. So I think, I think the West doesn't really, I think the West has had a real shock here. It's like, finally, I think they now realize like, Oh, Putin is not playing our game. Like he hasn't been, you know, and, and, I don't want to give any credit to Putin, but he, you know, he's been saying for a long time, like, oh, if NATO moves this way, then we will do something. And it's like, now he has. I, I think that conversation is now actually irrelevant. Like I said, people are dying and there's a war on and that's not going to reverse. 
Um, but yeah, it's like, I don't know. I, I just think that this was a long time coming, really. But again, I, I was naive. Like I said, I didn't think it was going to happen the way it did. But it, it was coming sort of thing. You know what I mean? You do think Lvov's, uh, sorry, uh, Kiev's going to fall? Uh, yeah. I just can't see how it won't, you know, unless there's a ceasefire agreement, uh, which I just think is not going to happen. It just, they're, they're making real incursions. They're in the, like the oblast now, which is like a borough. You know what I mean? Kiev oblast is like the borough of Kiev. You know what I'm saying? So they're on the outskirts, essentially, of Kiev. They're not in the city centre yet, but they're not far. You know, I think they're like five kilometres, you know, well, less than that, you know. So they're not far away. Um, I, I just don't see why they would stop. Unless they just realize how bad that will be for them due to guerrilla conflict, but I don't know. But they're going to go through that, and then what's next? <clears throat> what goes next after Kiev? I know. I, 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 who knows? You know. I mean, right now, if you look at the country, there's a pincer movement kind of forming. So they're like in the south. I think Odessa. Forgive me if I'm getting these wrong. I've looked at so many maps, but they're in like Odessa. They're coming in from the east as well over the Dnieper River in the north um, and like around, kind of surround, slowly coming around, you know, like a crescent. Yep. Um, and they're also, the bomb siren when a bomb siren went off today in Lviv, which is very far west, you know, and, and Belarus is, is talking about they're going to come from, there's a little breakaway region in Belarus called, uh, sorry, in Moldova called Transnistria, which is like some weird region that Russia controls and has done for, for a decade now, I think. Um, and they, they can stage troops from there, you know, to, to finish the pincer off, to make it whole. Uh, I'm no military strategist by any means at all, but just looking at the maps, it's like, if that's even remotely accurate, they're going to end up surrounded, you know. There's not a lot of Ukraine left. Right. There's Ukraine left as Ukraine. Yeah, there's not a lot of border. Well, I mean, they, Ukrainians have control over most of the country still. But yeah, there's not a lot of borders left that are not having movements come in. However, when you see these maps, I should I should say this as well. I'm kind of kind of going to go back on myself a little bit now. When you see these maps and it shows a pincer, that's not them lines are not. That's not how the lines are. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's not like every inch is one troop. You know what I mean? There might be five miles with no troops. Like the other day, um, Russia tried to form a pincer movement. I think around Kharkiv, and you know there was an area where there, there weren't enough troops there, or for whatever reason, and the Ukrainian just blasted through surrounded them you know and they, they they came away through it's very fluid it's kind of a misnomer to say front line because it's never really a line you know what i'm saying um it's not like yeah, trench yeah. warfare anymore no it's very no, spread exactly. out it's very spread out now yeah like for the last eight years in the east or at least the last six years when it was more on a ceasefire it was just trench warfare like it was very weird primitive like world war ii vibe actually it was very odd there and yeah like every so often they called it like a creeping movement you know they'd take a kilometer you know and then the kilometer would go but now it's like yeah it's all spread out it's like it's like you know if you pour a bottle of water down it just spreads out everywhere you know what i mean and, and then if you wipe it whatever it goes back and forth it's like that it's it's fluid um but i just can't see that putin's gonna what's he he's not gonna start this and lose face i think that's the, the problem it's like he's not a guy that wants to lose face he's like 70 this year he's getting old he wants his legacy you know i think he's gonna get it in his mind, whether whether he has to, you know, just kill everybody or not. He said, I think he said the other day, like, what's the point of a world without Russia or something, kind of, you know, inferring that, like, I don't know, like, we'll just wipe everybody out. I think Lavrov, his kind of second in command, was talking about nuclear stuff again the other day. Putin, two weeks ago, was in France saying, um, basically, like, if you dare trigger Article 5 of NATO, like, he mentioned, I can't remember the exact words, so I don't want to quote it, but he basically inferred, like, we will use a nuclear weapon whether they it will was, or not it was something know. like was it a force and counter-attack the likes of which the world has never seen yeah yeah, yeah yeah i mean that's very trumpian i guess to say that but right but it's putin <laughs> yeah 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 unfortunately <laughs> it's a, you know, a, yeah it's, it's worrying actually it is i don't want to like alarm anyone i don't think you know i keep a lot of friends i have around there like ring me up like it's world war three i said no no relax it's not it's, it's not that like you don't worry like we're not going to get bombed in in like the midlands or whatever but there is like a genuine, I think, reason to pay a bit more attention now because it's like, okay, this could, this could spiral out of control quite quick, you know. How would it spiral out of control? That, well, yeah, right. How? That's a good question because <laughs> well, nobody really knows. But for example, the other day, Keir Starmer was kind of saying, "Oh, we're going to talk about a no-fly zone." Uh, like, I, I really sympathise with Ukrainians, but if Britain starts implementing a no-fly zone, what are they going to do? Shoot down a Russian jet? great then we're then we're in war you know what i'm saying it's like 
that's no like you know i'm sorry but no like that's not a good idea um not to say that you know it, it, what can you do you know what i mean we, this you, is this, rock out of place like so that. uh so. constantin kissin who does trigonometry is uh russian ukrainian by birth and uh mm. it Anyone that wants to get a good primer um, who under- from somebody who understands the background of this, go and check that out. I'll link it in the show notes below. And um, one of the things that he said was, you've got a world where people have been making, for a very, very long time, a lot of war with words. And there's been mm-hmm. a lot of threats and um, incentives, disincentives, ways to try and push people back. Uh, and a lot of it's been bluffs. And you don't know whether you, that if you try and call it, whether that person's going to put their chips down on the table or not. But when push comes to shove, somebody basically asked him in the live chat, at what point is the West going to step in? And he said, okay, so let's say that all of Ukraine <laughs> does fall. When are you going to send British troops? When are you happy, you, when are you happy to go and fight? Are you happy mm. to go and fight when they invade Romania? Or mm. what about Estonia? Or what about, you know, just pick the line. Is it Germany? Is it France? Like, pick the line. Where is it? At which point do you want to put people on the ground Yeah, saying you don't get to go any further? Is it Kiev? Is it Lvov? Is it, you know? It's a, yeah, I mean, it's what, like, I mean, I wouldn't want to be a politician right now. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be a politician ever. But, but yeah, it's like, what, what do they, what do they do? And I don't want, you know, I don't want dragging like Brits into, or anybody, you know, in Europe, dragging them into a war but yeah, it's like, well, what if the war comes to us first? You know, it's like, I, I, again, I don't think that will happen, but I didn't think this was going to happen, you know? So you have to be very careful because I don't want to be alarmist because I, I think, I really think that it would definitely, I do think negotiations after Russia has had, or I shouldn't say Russia, after Putin has had his kind of fill of blood, you know, I think I think that it would, it just wouldn't really make sense for them to, what are they going to do, trigger, trigger NATO? And then they've got like all of like, what, 27 countries or something. The rest we'll of the world, fight. like. You know, that really will be a world war. That actually will be. It's like, are they going to do that? Maybe, maybe they will. But I don't know. I, I, I really hope not. Um, I think that, I think the problem is though, it, it's like you said, it's all words right now, isn't it? And it's like, it, we got to remember as well, like, let's scale it back. We're one week into this invasion. It feels like a lot longer because of the constant media attention, which is completely relevant and, and warranted. But let's just like calm down a bit i think like let's relax don't worry there's not gonna be a world war hopefully i mean you, you'll air this when we're at when when we're at war i've got that i've got that <laughs> clip yeah exactly jake hanrahan, jake hanrahan says said, <laughs> idiot but i i don't well maybe there will be but you know i think that's that's probably a long way off you know i hope so <laughs> i mean jesus christ but if they do take all of ukraine which you know they're, they're gonna try it's not like they can then i mean they only have a certain amount of soldiers you know like they're they're gonna they're gonna do that but they're gonna be bogged down in a war for a long time in ukraine my thought is maybe it's useful for russia to have a long sustained war in europe maybe that's useful for them maybe that's really that puts them on a on a different footing you know and it's they know that they know that the west is not gonna start attacking them in in ukraine you know what i mean so I think that hopefully, you know, it's feel bad to say this to the Ukrainians because obviously it's bad for them, but like hopefully it just stops there. Um, but yeah. Maybe is, it, is there an element of this where it's useful, again, trying to be as sensitive as possible to the fact that there's hundreds of people dying and a yeah. country being invaded? Is it in one way useful for the West to finally see that Putin is prepared to put his money or his guns where his mouth is? Uh, and that this could be a little bit like an inoculation <laughs> against mm. thinking that he is all just words and then pa- um, perhaps upscaling our response or our readiness at least to him. Yeah, I get your point. I mean, I, I don't think it's ever useful, but I, I totally get what you mean. It's like it, 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 what it has been is a wake-up call, right? You know, it's been a wake-up call. I, I, I don't know why it's all, all of a sudden. But, you know, this this isn't the first you know, people, it is a very big conflict, but what about the Balkan Wars? That was a massive war in Europe, you know, when Yugoslavia collapsed. That went on for, for a long time, and it was very brutal, very bloody. Um, you know, NATO bombed Serbia, um, got involved there. Russia is in a different place right now as they were back then. You know, I don't, I don't think that would run, really, for, uh, for, for NATO to do something like that anymore. Um, but, yeah, I think the wake-up call, I think Europeans need to realize that war isn't just something that happens to 
people over there that are a different color to us it's like no i mean firstly most of the wars there are because of us over here in, in health and, and safety and we we did whatever and invaded their countries but it's like yeah now i think a lot of people are realizing like oh okay that's that all oh, right yeah that can happen like yeah i think we were in this i don't believe in the concept but there's this weird um concept of like um the end of history you know and i think a lot of people were lulled into that idea that nothing that bad can happen again here <laughs> you know and it's like it can happen here anytime, you know, like, I, I don't think, I think we got a little bit too comfortable, maybe not that there's anything wrong with that. We shouldn't, we should want to live in peace and we should feel peaceful, but everybody should, you know? And I, I do think that I've seen some quite horrific gloating from countries that have been at war. Um, not to blame them because you don't know what their life has been like after like you us like bombed them or whatever you know what i mean but again it does show that like yeah they're realizing like now you lot realize you know what i mean and it's not even at our doorstep really yet you know what i'm saying as western european you know areas uh, are obviously quite disconnected from from ukraine in a way so yeah it's, it's like it is a wake-up call um i saw the other day that like I think Germany said they're going to put like a billion into like defense spending or something like that. I could be wrong, but it was a lot of money. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, very clearly. I mean, Britain, I don't know. Like Britain, I think like we had some of the lowest um, people signing up to the military the last couple of years, like the lowest numbers. You know what I mean? And I imagine that, you know, Britain and other countries, if not, not because they're worried that we're going to get invaded by Russia or anything, but I guess they, they, there must be people thinking right now, like, hmm, okay, we need to do something else, you know, just, just in case. What like the Ukrainians did. What's your plan moving forward? Are you going back out there? I do want to, but I'm older now. Like when I was younger, I was like tapped. <laughs> I think I, I wasn't like brave. I was just, I was, I, I was just like, this is my career. I, you know, like, I'm not, I'm not from like a academic or journalistic family, just from a very normal family. And I was like, I've got to make my mark. I have to really go all out with this. I will go to any front line, you know, and I did a lot of crazy things not crazy, but you know, I, I consider now like a little bit too risky, you know? So now that I'm older, I'm like, I've got responsibilities, you know, my family needs me. Um, you know, you know, so I am, I'll be honest, I know it's selfish, but I am starting to think like, do I, am I going to go back out? But I do want to go back out. You know, um, I, I definitely, what I am interested, as I mentioned earlier, I'm interested in these like anti-fascist battalions. There's a Jewish battalion, you know, like I, I think that element of the war is quite, what what my biz, what my company does like popular front our organization we focus on the underreported stuff you know what i mean so i think that would be really valuable for us to do that and to show the world like hey it's not just you know far right or it's not just whatever it's it's all different people and i think that would be valuable reporting which it's like i would consider the risk you know worth doing but you have to measure it on like <laughs> when you know what i mean like things are happening so rapidly now i have a lad that is working with me on my team before he's going out on his own freelance not for us because i was like no i'm not i'm not sending someone off to that but he's gone on his own and he just went straight away and i was like look don't do it wait a week he's okay but you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow or the next day you know like we've just seen a rocket strike in kiev yesterday perhaps we didn't think that was going to happen or the day before maybe we didn't think that would happen now it has so i i think i think uh, i'm going around the houses here i'm trying to like justify to myself well, why I think I you, what we, what you're showing is the internal uh turmoil yeah, right. that you're going through right the reason yeah, that you don't yeah, have a strict yeah. answer is because you don't know one um, i don't know i think at the very least i'll go to the polish border and like film the refugee situation i think that's important to do um i have a lot of i know a lot of people out there that are really helping collecting you know like doing a lot um yeah it's it's uh it's a tricky one man yeah i don't know i don't know i think i think for me uh, i think I just want to wait because not, not just because of the risk, but it's like, it would be quite hard to do the story I want to do right now. Cause it's so fluid. They, they're they like, Hey, we just formed our unit. They don't want a journo being like, Oh, talk, give me an interview, you know, like, and they have quite strict like rules because you know, they are their own unit, but they came under the territorial defense, this kind of, you know, this umbrella of like militia forces that the government has kind of started. So they do have to follow ironically, they're anarchists, but you know, they, they're realists. So they have to follow certain rules and that, you know, so I think for everybody's sake, it's like, do I need to be there right now? Probably not. You know what I mean? But uh, my mate who's there now, he was like, don't come. He was like, it's it's very hard to work um, and it's just not worth it, you know? So we'll see. But hopefully, I mean, no matter what, if it goes, I mean, if this goes on for a year, there's no way I'm not going back out. You know what I'm saying? But for the moment, I think I'm going to do what I can from here and help people out there that I can. You know, we, we raised some money as well. We raised like five grand to, to give to like um, civilians uh, on the front line that need medical aid. 
Um, there's a lot of people doing stuff like that. I think that's a good thing to do. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I'm a reporter, but at the end of the day, I'm a human being. And it's like, and I've done exactly, I've done things for this in other countries as well. You know what I mean? Not just, not just European countries. So I think it's, I think that is probably best efforts are there and just like showing the world what's happening as best I can, trying to avoid all the, I'm getting so much hate right now. Like it's just from everywhere. Trying to, trying to stay not unbiased. I, I don't believe in total objectivity, but trying to just be like, here's what's happening. This is a clear thing of happening. This is happening and this is happening. You know, people, why are you saying that? Why are you saying that? You're making us all look far right. No, I'm not. But I'm not going to ignore the fact that there was a situation at the border where Africans weren't allowed to cross the border. I'm not going to ignore that. I am not your PR. You know, a lot of people don't realize that. So I am not a press agent. I'm a reporter. I'm a journalist. And that's that. And then on the other side, you know, there's people going, why are you showing that there's an anti-fascist force? We don't like them. I don't care. <laughs> it's like, this is my job, you know. Oh, you're like, you're pro-NATO. Why? Because I don't think that a country should come in and kill children. Like, you know, it's just a lot of that. So it, it's quite stressful at the minute, but it's nothing compared to what people are on the field doing. You know what I mean? Well, doesn't that show the fact that it's really difficult for people now, after spending so much time attaching narratives and ideologies to things because we've got this sort of co completely transparent communication medium that nothing nothing can be just a thing nothing can be yeah. just an incident yeah, or an action yeah. everything has to have an ideology or a narrative yes. or an agenda attached to it and that's what people are, are, it seems like they're doing yeah exactly that exactly that and i do I, I hate to even moan about it because it is so unbelievably irrelevant the second you log out <laughs> you know what i mean but at the same time, it's relevant in the sense that where we get all our information is on the social medias now. So it is a, I mean, I have people like, I have people like messaging me on my personal like Instagram, just like, you know, like you piece of shit, you're scum. Like, it's like, why? Like, you know, like some guy the other day was posting something. He's in like some weird, like hyper political group, or whatever. And he's posting some like bizarre thing from some kind of political guy in Russia about why it's okay for them to go and kill everybody, basically. And like he just had some like real issue with me, and I had a, I angry. I was like, "Fuck you!" And then I messaged him afterwards. I was like, "You know what? If you're ever in London, let's have a drink. You can call me the CIA. It's all good. You know what I mean?" Like a lot of these people are angry online, but in real life, firstly, a lot of them are not that brave. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not that I'm a you tough guy. You never meet a hater in real life, man. Right? You know, I'm not not saying I'm a tough guy, but certain things. There's the golden rule, right? Like you chat shit, get banged. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that still exists. And then secondly, it's like a lot of these people are probably not as bad as they seem. They just like you could probably sit down with them, but that the internet is no longer the place for that. You know what I mean? So I, I think advice to myself, maybe, and to other people is just ignore it. I, I'm just like blocking, block, 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 because I, I can't. I don't want to deal with that shit, man. I just want to do my job. You know what I mean? Um, and if that makes me CIA agent, a Nazi, a pro crypt, whatever, you know, whatever it is, like so be it. Call me that. I don't care. It's, it's fine. Like it's all good. I've been to the front line, and it's like, what am I gonna do? Be like, hey guys. You're, you're risking your life, but look what this guy's saying about you on Twitter. Like, they're like, what? <laughs> like, I, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, so you have to get perspective. You know what I mean? Um, and these people think they're so important by going on these long, like, you know, dialogues and, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, really, they're not. They're just, it's just, the irony is that a lot of these people that were talking about like, oh, the left liberals or whatever, or the right wing, or whatever, they wanted their moment of fame. They're always talking about themselves. Now they're doing exactly the same thing. How can I make this war about my ideology? It's all its all the same thing. Left, right, up, down. It's like, who cares? You know, we, we have a saying, and it's kind of corny, but we say popular front is for the people. That's not really politically charged. We just mean, like, we care about the people on the ground. We care about what they're going through. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of try and represent that feeling in our reporting more than <laughs> someone angry on the Instagram, you know? Tell everybody where they can go if they want to support what you do and when this when's the film going to come out as well? Don't ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is the edit is the edit an ugly one? Oh, mate, the edit is hell because things are changing so rapid, you know. But hopefully this weekend, you know, like hopefully Sunday is is, is like the and latest. Will, will that be on the Popular Front YouTube? Yeah, yeah. So so it's youtube.com slash popular front. All our documentaries are there. We have a podcast as well. Um it's it's just search it, you know, whatever. If you go to our website, popularfront.co, you'll find links to everything. Um and if I can, I just want to say we're completely grassroots. We take no funding from corporations just because I've seen it muddy the waters with things before. And I decided when I launched this, I want it to be funded, you know, grassroots. So we have a Patreon, you know, a subscription service. There's a lot of extra content there, patreon.com slash popular front. And we take donations and we have, we have sponsors, but only from people we know that don't fuck their workers over. You know, that's just a personal kind of position that we have. Um, so yeah, man, if people want to support, they want to look us up, just popular front. Instagram is probably the best place right now because everybody seems to be flooding there. 
That's popular dot front. Um, and yeah, man, we're just putting stuff out all the time. We do make mistakes now and then, as everybody does. We're human beings. We have a very small team. There's like four of us, you know what I mean? Like constant. Um, but we're doing our best and we're double checking things. And I think, you know, I think we're doing quite well. I appreciate the work that you do, man. Good luck with uh, everything that's really coming. It's a really great up. conversation, man. Like, that's really things, a lot, a lot of things I haven't really thought of. So I really appreciate that. My pleasure. Dude, stay safe. Cheers, mate. Thank you, man. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.